everyone, and welcome to 2023. It's going to be a fabulous year. Well, I love to host and have visitors. So today I have a very special guest from Texas. Jesse Huth is here. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for stopping by. Howdy. Thanks for having me. How are things in Texas? Oh, going well. Just uh, enjoying the cold weather bird watching. <laughs> well, that's a nice background you have there. Lots of bird activity I can see. Oh, look at that. Yeah, tit mouse. <laughs> there's, there's our little hybrid titmouse that we get here in central Texas. But oh. yeah, that that was a different time of year I made that recording. So it's a little greener in the background than it's it is beautiful. right now. I mean, we have snow up to our knees. So this is so refreshing uh, <laughs> to see. You know, Texas is so special. You know, actually, last week when I was trying to get in touch with you, you were on the bird tour, a bird walk. Was that in Texas? Yes. Yeah. I do little bird walks all around Texas. I have a one that I do every month right here in the hill country for my local birding company or uh, birding club. Uh, okay. It's a Wimberley Birding Society. And then I do trips all over Texas, uh, either chasing rare birds on my own or leading tours, doing uh, private guided bird watching. I've got a few of those coming up in the next few weeks. Oh, wow. So yeah, I keep busy. And when I'm not birding uh, professionally, I generally spend my free time birding on my own. <laughs> so on own. Okay. <laughs> I'm a little obsessed. <laughs> so, I mean, Texas, you know, the weather is so different in Texas comparing mm -hmm. to us, you know, like here I go on my birding walks in May when all the warblers and all migratory birds arrive. But what about Texas? Like when, when are your peak seasons there that people can visit and find birds that are not normally maybe seen anywhere else? Well, Texas is wonderful in that it has a bunch of different ecoregions. So it's very biodiverse and there's almost always something interesting to see no matter what time of year you're here. Now, April is probably going to be the peak, peak season because mm -hmm. again, that's spring migration. That's April right. leading into May, it's always got the migrants coming through plus the resident birds. Uh, so if you're kind of come down to the coast, if you want to see our specialty birds like the golden cheeked warbler, which is a Texas nesting endemic, it only nests right here in the Texas Hill oh, Country. Wow. It's an endangered species. So you've got to come here to see it unless you want to go chase it down in the jungles of Central America in the wintertime. Uh, right. But uh, so spring is definitely the peak season, okay. but winter birding is great as well, because down in the Rio Grande Valley, down in South Texas, we have our specialty birds down there, like the green jays, the great kiskadees, white tip doves, Altamira orioles, and they're there year round. So right. if you are stuck somewhere where it's freezing cold with snow on the <laughs> ground, you can come down to South Texas where, depending on the weather, you may be able to wear shorts in the middle of winter and still have an enjoyable time outside looking oh. at all the specialty birds that we have here. Oh. Uh, fall is good for birding as well because yes. you can catch some of the fall migrants coming through. Pretty much the only time that isn't great for birding in Texas is in the middle of summer. It's just... Quite you have a couple hours to bird in the morning and then it gets over 100 degrees and the birds are smart enough to not be moving in that and most of the people are too yes, so yes <laughs> yes i remember those times you know i've spent uh, quite a, a, a few a few months in texas so i remember yes you don't go outside in the middle of the summer you just you yeah. can't breathe so yep. it's so hot so yeah i understand that okay and you know i remember when you first participated in one of our photo concerts and i wrote back to you and i, I really remember that, that your email said chicken boy and then i looked it up and yes. i actually realized that you were a poultry specialist is that right mm -hmm. yes so tell yeah us that's <laughs> hello titmouse <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so tell us what's is this what you is, is that your day job or what is this uh well that was supposed to be my day job okay uh, when when i was really young growing up uh, early teens i'd I'd started birding already when I was about six, but at the same time, I started raising chickens and I got to be known as Chicken Boy around town. Okay. Uh, that's another passion of mine. I love just 
chickens, raising them, showing them, enjoying them, running around in my backyard. Okay. So uh, I hadn't really thought about birding professionally at the time. That was just a fun hobby. And I'd always been chicken boy. Okay. And so my original career path was I was going to uh, become Dr. Chicken and <laughs> help people raise their chickens, Absolutely. learn all about chickens. So I uh, went to Texas A&M University and studied poultry science there for okay. four years. And then after that, I continued on for my master's degree and studied poultry welfare and behavior. So that basically meant I scared chickens for two years, wrote 80 page thesis on it, and uh, they gave me a degree for it. <laughs> <laughs> that so that's like poultry. a fun profession. <laughs> yeah, uh, poultry research was fun. Uh, but after I finished grad school, I realized that academia wasn't really the path that I had the passion for. I loved right. being in the field and working with the chickens, not necessarily just uh, studying them and then writing a bunch of papers on it. All right. uh, I, I like being outside doing stuff. So I uh, after that, decided I would start doing poultry consultations. So going out in people's backyards, helping them get their flocks set up. There's okay. a lot of people moving out here to, into the country, kind of coming out of Austin, out of the cities, and they're getting chickens for the first time and they need someone to help them get everything set up, uh, figure out how to keep the raccoons out of the chicken coop, uh, what to feed them, what type of chickens to get. So that was going to be my main business was poultry consultations. All right. But then I got uh, involved in leading birding tours, and that's kind of taken over my life as my primary job. I still do the poultry consultations because that's right. something I can fit in between birding tours and between bird surveys when I'm home. And uh, so I still do that as well. But the primary thing I'm focusing on now is now that I've realized I can get paid to go bird watching, is uh, leading these birding tours because that gets me outside, keeps me in the field, and yeah. uh, I like seeing and traveling the world. So that Absolutely. gives me a chance to do that. So how many, how many bird species do you have on your list now? That's, you know, the, the, your bird list. You uh, on my overall. Yes. I keep track. My overall world life list right now, I think is 2,168 wow. species. Wow. Uh, so uh, obviously that's a lot from traveling out of the country. You get yes. down to South America, you can get hundreds and hundreds of birds, but yeah, I've been, uh, the last few years focusing more on birding here in Texas because obviously I yeah. couldn't really go anywhere <laughs> too far away. Sure. But uh, so I've been doing county listing in Texas. I've finally finished birding in every single county in Texas. Uh, and there's uh, 254 counties. So that took quite a while. <sighs> and now I'm working on getting 100 birds in each one of those counties. Bravo. So yeah, right. that just gives me a task to work for for the rest of my life. <laughs> what, so much fun. And actually, you know, that's what I wanted to ask you about your other tours, because I've seen that you are you taking people to Ecuador. Is that what's lined up uh, yes. soon? So yes. um, how do you decide where to go? Like, why Ecuador? Well, uh, I've been to Ecuador once, but I just went down there on my own. Okay. So I just went down, rented a car, drove around for a few weeks, which was fun. Uh, but I didn't really know what I was looking at a lot of the times. It, it, it was a kind of a refreshing experience reminding me what beginning birding was like again, because I, I started so young here in the US, I just kind of intuitively know most of the birds I run right. across. But yes. down there, it's like I had to relearn how to use a field guide again because I just didn't know every bird instantly. And there's hundreds of birds. Oh, yes. Uh, Latin America. So, so this time around, uh, Ecuador is an easy place for people to travel to. So I talked with the tour company I work for and uh, kind of gauged interest on where some people might be wanting to go. Okay. And then talked to some of my local birders, got a few people interested. Uh, talked about where they wanted to go, and we settled on Ecuador. Okay. And so now this tour is being run through uh, Partnership for International Birding, the tour company I work for. And they have a local guide down there as well. That's how this company works, is everywhere they lead tours, they use local guides. Yeah. So we have a local Ecuador guide that will be with us for this tour. And I go along as kind of the uh, company representative, trip host, uh, solve all the issues that go on in the tour if anything happens like that, and just kind of manage the birders so the guide can focus on finding the birds. So this time I'll get to go down there and uh, actually have a professional local who knows all the little flycatchers and 
uh, really difficult birds that I wasn't able to get the first time around. So I'm looking forward to that for my own personal list, oh, but it's also a place I've already been. So I feel comfortable taking a group with me there because uh, I kind of know the areas and have someone else now to deal with finding all the specialty birds that I didn't get the last time around. That's that's uh, absolutely fascinating. So how many trips do you have planned to go into Ecuador? Uh, just the one. Just the one. Okay. And so, how big is your group? Uh, it should be eight people. Eight and that's people. the that's the maximum size group we will run in okay. this company. So if yeah. there is interest, are you willing to travel more often? Like, how does it work? You, you basically, if people get in touch with you and you organize a group, you'll take them to Ecuador again? Pretty much. Yeah, I do have a set schedule that I work with with the company ahead of time. So I've okay. planned out all the places I'm hopefully going to be guiding over the next year. That's dependent on the trip, getting enough people to actually uh, go ahead. If there's okay. only one or two signups, uh, either the trip won't happen or we'll just have to increase the trip price for a smaller group. Just give right. a little supplement there. Uh, okay. But uh, so I've got my setup schedule, but that is somewhat flexible. If people are interested in going somewhere else or uh, they want to kind of merge a couple different tours together right. into one uh, since it's all very small groups it we can usually work around those and if uh, someone has their own group of friends if they want to do a tour with them and five friends then that can be entirely custom uh just for right. their own group we can go wherever they want bird however we want we can do either really intense listing every day get as many bird species as possible <laughs> or take it a little slower right. enjoy the birds a little bit more take some pictures do some cultural stuff see some local sites uh it, it's entirely dependent on the group there right. <laughs> and i do at least in texas uh, i do uh, shorter private guiding trips as well. So if you're just coming to Texas and you want a day or two of birding, you don't need a full week-long group tour, but you just want to see something s special like a whooping crane or a golden oh, cheek warbler yes, yes. or spend a couple days down in Rio Grande Valley looking at whatever rare birds have showed up down there because there's there's always something. There's a social mm -hmm. flycatcher mm -hmm. right now, but uh, uh, we can set that up and do day tours. There's a festival, a birding festival in uh, Rio Grande. That just happened. It, oh, it happens happened early, right. early November. Okay. Uh, that's so right. that's usually the first week in November. And it's a great festival. I go down there All every right. year. I, I guide for the festival. So well. I do okay. do some of the uh, tours down there. So if anyone shows up to the tour, uh, I'll probably be there on some of the tours cool. <laughs> walking around. But yeah, it's a great festival, a uh, great introduction to birding in South Texas. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. You get to meet a lot of birders as well. And yes. there's always something rare that gets found because when you have hundreds of highly skilled birders concentrated in one area, nice. birding properties that oftentimes don't get birded just because they're a little bit more out of the way and mm -hmm. people always hit the the main stuff but having that many eyes spread out for that week there's always something that gets discovered that's fun to chase like really? social flycatcher was last year's big discovery and it actually it was i think the third record in the united states no way and it is still there. It's stuck around for a full year. It's just sitting around at a little university down there. Uh, and this year, it was the first Texas record of smooth build Ani that got found. So, yeah, there's there's always something. Hook build kite flying around. We had the, wow. the big first record uh, last year of bat falcon that showed up, which I spent about a month down there last year guiding people to see the bat falcon and the social flycatcher. So... Sounds yeah, like a lot of fun. Oh, it's a lot awesome. of fun. Well, um, that's it's really interesting to to hear. And you know, I, definitely when I'm in Texas next time, I hope it will happen soon. I will give you a call and yeah. ask you to take me out because some of the birds that you know you see maybe on a regular basis, I've never seen because you know we're Absolutely. in Quebec, a totally different ecosystem. Yep. And so, um, we'll post your email, your phone number for people yeah. to get in touch with you if they have any questions about Texas birds or if they want to go on a tour there or go to Ecuador or any other. <laughs> interesting places for birds jesse is your man right jesse yep All yep right. and, and i do tours outside of texas as well so okay. i do i kind of i'm kind of the southwestern guide for this tour company so okay. i do uh arizona tours a lot new mexico going up to bosque del apache and up to sandia crest for the rosy finches do 
Colorado. Okay. Uh, I've started kind of being our secondary guide for Hawaii as well. We've got an excellent guide that lives mm -hmm. on the island, but if she gets uh, completely booked out for the year, I'll jump in and take a few tours out there as well, oh, which wow. I yeah, it's kind of hard to turn down. Yeah, got to go to Hawaii <laughs> again. <laughs> After all those endangered species. <laughs> yes, yes, yep. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your visit, Jesse. That's so fascinating to learn about uh, your experience and what you do for the birds. Yep. And um, all the best to you, and we'll be in touch shortly. Sounds good. Thanks right, for having take me. take care. Chris came across a few posts saying that mealworms can be harmful for birds, so he's asked Dr. Bird to clarify this. Hi Chris. This is a perfect example of how something wildly false can get posted on the internet and not only end up going viral, but also wasting a lot of folks' time trying to set the record straight. Let me state quite clearly, mealworms, the larval form of the mealworm beetle, are not harmful to birds of any age and moreover, they are a totally acceptable food item that one can offer to backyard birds. They come in two formats, dried or live and wriggling, but the appeal of the latter to most songbirds is far greater, luckily due to the movement factor. It's true to say that mealworms in either format are not equivalent to the various insects found in nature in terms of nutritional value, mainly because of how they're produced. They are easily raised in very large quantities on a diet of oat or wheat bran and some commercial companies ship out tons of live mealworms all over the world on a monthly basis. Mealworms are not only favored by those feeding wild birds, but also are used extensively at wildlife rehabilitation centers to feed orphan and injured insect-eating songbirds. In the latter case, the mealworms are often coated with formulated powder to give them an extra nutritional punch. So what's the problem? Well, in recent months, someone came up with a ridiculous notion that dried mealworms in particular somehow get compacted in the stomachs of birds, especially nestlings and fledglings, and result in mortality through constipation and dehydration. Believe me, if this was a valid concern, we would have heard a long time ago from the wildlife rehabilitation folks. Moreover, I taught gastrointestinal physiology, the study of digestion in birds, for 30 years, and I can tell you that birds have the most remarkable, well-developed digestive systems that can handle all sorts of food items ranging from the hardest nuts in the world to bones, fur, feathers, fish scales, and the chitinous exoskeletons of insects. Let me finish by again repeating that mealworms in both dried and live formats are a terrific food item to offer to one's backyard birds. The only thing that they might be hard on is one's wallet. This year on Bird Alphabets, we're going to stay on the same letter to cover as many most common bird species that start with that letter. So for example, this episode, we will be talking about American goldfinches for letter A. And on the next episode, it will still be the letter A and it will be American crows. I don't know about you, but I cannot imagine my bird feeders without American goldfinches. They're such a staple bird here, and I just love watching males change their coats in the spring. They're so beautiful. And because they're finches, they're quite nomadic here in the winter. They come and go in search of food all the time. So some winters I can have anywhere over you know a hundred of them on my bird feeders. I have to put up extra feeders and spread them out. And other winters like this year, I'll get one or two of them show up here and there. So if one day you don't see any American goldfinches on your bird feeders, don't worry, they'll be back. Females and males are super easy to tell apart in the summer because males are so vibrantly yellow and then in the winter both of them look kind of drab so it's not that easy to distinguish them. And just like with many other brightly colored bird species, females choose the most colorful mates they can find. Guess what? Well, birds get their color from their diet. So basically, the brighter you are in color, the brighter you are in foraging and finding and eating the best foods for you. You know, you wanna make sure that your mates can look after your family, right? I personally love that American goldfinches start their nesting season later than any other bird species because everyone arriving at the same time and then starting to nest at the same time is a little bit too overwhelming. So as soon as I see goldfinches on our thistle flowers, I know that they started their nesting season, which is here in the east is quite short. It's basically from 
end of June to mid-August. But believe it or not, females try to fit two broods in that short period of time, often leaving the first brood for daddy to look after while she finds another mate. Well, that doesn't always work out so well. To attract American goldfinches to your backyard, make sure to have um, a weedy patch in your garden and try to grow native plants from the compositive family, which are zinnias, coneflowers, yarrow, thistle, marigolds, anything like this. There's actually a long list of those flowers that you can grow. American goldfinches are granivorous. That's a new word for me. Basically, it's all about seeds for them. That's why cowbirds chicks don't really survive in their nests because cowbirds need bugs and goldfinches don't do bugs even for their young. They love thistle and they will happily eat niger at your niger feeders. But if you've tried niger and they didn't react so well to it, try switching to thistle. You might have more luck with that. Another reason to grow plants from that composite family is because American goldfinches love to line their nests with that, um, you know, pappas is called, but it's actually like cotton, like this white fluff that these flowers produce. Uh, if you don't have flowers like that, you can actually put out uh, natural undyed cotton for them and they will use it as well. American goldfinches lay on average five eggs. Males actually live longer than females. The oldest goldfinch in the wild was 11 years old. And just a quick reminder, goldfinches are very susceptible to conjunctivitis. So please make sure your bird feeders are clean. Well, that's it. That's all for now. Let me know if you are going to be traveling to see birds anytime soon. I'd love to see your pictures. Take care, everyone. I'll see you in two weeks.